Welcome to Danny Houlihan's Irish Experience Podcast. Join Danny on a journey through the historical island of Ireland, its people and the wild Atlantic Way, which is Ireland's last frontier. Experience the music and the culture that makes up the longest coastal driving route in the world. Now, please welcome your host, Danny Houlihan. Welcome to the Wild Atlantic Way and Danny Houlihan's Irish Experience Show. I hope you're all keeping well and safe, my friends. And for those of you who are new to my podcast series, welcome to you all. And I hope you will enjoy the research I'll be sharing in my episodes and my YouTube channel. So check that out as well and subscribe to see the visual aspects of my podcast from time to time. So sit back, and if you are driving, please take care as I travel back to the ancient parish of Kilihini or Kiletna. In this exploratory episode, I will trawl into the historical material and available evidence that I have found both oral and written to provide provenance to the episode. I have, during my podcast series, carried out many, many days of field research with a clear objective and a campaign for research. My episodes with a clear objective in mind, such as in this episode, what is left of the ancient parish and townland called Kilihene and Ballye, now within the parish of Ballybunnan in North Kerry, Ireland. I am consistently testing the hypothesis against more data I have researched, both written records, ordnance survey maps, aerial photography, oral traditions, and the natural landscape which still holds its secrets. Then after initial surveys of sites, including photography, video recording, and mapping, I cross-reference all data to see if there's any shred of evidence in the oral tradition that can be transferred into fact. Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. Then, in conclusion to my research, I devise a model or a description of the research compiled to date that seems best to summarise the historical patterns of past life ways I have observed in the data uncovered during my research. This research is ongoing and opens up the conversation and debate with our Irish diaspora abroad who are out there searching frantically for their ancestry, whose people were forced into immigration during the Great Irish Holocaust of 1845, 46 and Black 47, commonly known as the Great Irish Famine, from the area of Kilihene or Kiletna and Ballye or Balleonia in an area known in North Kerry as Ballybunion. The name Kilihene takes its name from the prefix kil, meaning a cell or a church, which has connections with the early Christian period or pre-ecclesiastical, a time of isolated holy men and indeed holy women, living in isolated areas at that time, making their communion with the divine God and connecting with the rich cultured Irish communities that surrounded their settlements. Evidence and provenance are very hard to pin down these early settlements, but what remains in the history records, sometimes very small insignificant mentions, and I have to state to some historians, it's not worth travelling out to or to visit these places. All that is used is just a quick source of reference. I travel out to search these places for anything that might give us a clue into these past life ways and forgotten people and their cultures. The name Eni from Kilihene is broken down from Etna or Athena, a pre-Christian holy woman that lived in the era of Ballye or the townland of the deer, where they say the present graveyard is today, located next to the famous Ballybunnan Golf Club south of the present seaside town of Ballybunion in North Kerry Island. There is a graveyard, as I stated, called Kilihene, surrounded by an 1800s rough cut stone wall. The ruins of the former church of Kilihene, a Kiletna, in its history, has been cited according to historians, where the graveyard is now located today. Grid reference 
83311 All that is left of the kill or the church, which according to historians, the old foundations, are buried deep within the soil of the west section of the graveyard. The graveyard can be found on any map of the area of Ballybunion, located next to the famous Ballybunion Golf Club on Santa Road, Ballybunion, County Kerry, Ireland. Rising to the east of the graveyard, the land today is well drained and open. This rises the Canucanor Hill to the east. Killehene is located on an elevated site on a former high dune now levelled over the centuries. It has been related to me in the past by historians that items of household such as ballon stones, curtain stones, and indeed the remains of clock-ons have been found several metres northeast of the graveyard, near the Kitties River, now covered up. Also ballon stones, which I should say were used for the making of flour, have been found within the confines of the graveyard, thus providing provenance that there was an early settlement there. Finding all these household implements points to a much larger settlement and a large population which should be noted to the northeast and the south of the graveyard. I should state, to make it very clear, I have been informed on several occasions of items found over the years there, but this information gets to me pretty late to initiate any recovery attempt, as the diggers had done their damage, and it was too late. However, these items over the years that have been found have been lost or reused for building materials in the area, and are not available for research. Lost to time and tide. The area of the settlement was located near a water source, which was the Kitties River, which meanders its way from the higher ground, from east to west. This came from the Canucanore area, and in those times the area of Kilihene was covered in a dense oak forest. This not only gave shelter from the prevailing winds, but added shelter for wild boar or pig and native Irish red deer, a potential food source which flourished in the area. The annual feast day of St. Etna was normally celebrated on the 6th of June and sometimes in July locally. However, in the Irish calendar, Etna's feast day was celebrated on January the 11th. All that is known of Etna or Athena's mission is that the woman had a kind heart and fed and clothed the poor of the area and the dying. Her deeds were many and are lost to time. Her cell or church was according to old historians a very small one, or stone clock on. Located, as I've stated, where the cemetery is now located today, shaded by the high sandals near Ballybun and Golf Club. Some historians have stated that Etna, or Athena, was a daughter of the High King Lyra of Ireland, and she was a sister of Fidelma, or Saint Fidelma. Tradition relates that the two sisters met Saint Patrick, who baptised them, and after this special event, they took the veil. One can just imagine Etna or Athena collecting water from the nearby Kitty's River with a wooden handmade bucket. The stream ran several metres from the old kill, and Etna foraging in the high woods that bordered the dunes, and helping the poor people of the area. History lost to time. When Etna's mission was established, we don't know as she was a female in an area dominated by many, many male missions, which lived side by side by her. The question I put forward now is, was Etna's mission one of the early Kuldi movements, similar to that of Derico or the Ramokua, mentioned in the Feira of Festologies of English the Kuldi, located upriver on the river Kossan Kiri Lucra, or the pathway to the ancient kingdom of Kir? I will research into this at another stage. So keep an eye on my podcast series. In this episode, apart from local oral traditions handed down to me by historians and locals, I have consulted with various sources. I have consulted many maps and records still in existence. All maps of the Kilihini area in 1669, Lord Kerry's map of his estate dated. Petty's map, 1683, which mentions Kilihini, K-I-L-L-A-H-E-N-Y, and in the 1756 Smith map mentions K-I-L-L-E-I-N-Y, Kilihene as well. The Arden survey maps, 1841. Kilihene graveyard, extract from OS 
1846, sheet 004, Killehenna Graveyard, extract from the Ordnance Survey, 2nd edition, 1898, sheet 004-15 plus 14, identifies the site location of the church ruined or cell. Killehenna, or Killehenna is listed in the record of monuments and places in Ireland as KE 004-043001. I have inserted as much information as I have to date in this episode, which in the future will be updated accordingly. Now I journey back to the ancient parish and the landscape of Kilheni or Kiletna, into its deep hidden history and our people, to uncover its past and its past lifeways, and make a pioneering attempt with Danny Hulan's Irish experience to reconnect with our past and the past lifeways, our people, who were scattered around the globe and who were forced to leave their special place along the banks of the Cashin River many, many moons ago, at the hands of the absentee landlords from London in their quest for land and greed. Our famous townland had under its geographical area 13 towns, bollies or townlands. These townlands made up a considerable population within the parish of the old civil parish of Kilehenny or Kiletna and Bellier or Balia Anir, the townland of the deer. Every one of them had their distinctive name or been associated with the landscape of the area and also the wild deer, Rahunuk. Ra takes its name from a circular ring fort, which during the Iron Age and early Christian period were the homes and strongholds of our ancestors. But they lived and survived in safety with their families and animals, safe from attack. The word Ra, a fort, Una takes its name from a grave, the fort of the grave. One local story that was related to me many years ago was that of a local boy who one day entered a fort in Doon, north of Rahuna, where a large serpent was sleeping. The young boy always wanted to catch such an animal of that size. The young boy approached the beast, giving it a strong kick in the rear. The animal, quite surprised by the assault on his privacy, chased the young boy as far as Rahuna where the beast died of a heart attack. The young boy learned his lesson, never to approach an animal like that in the future. I have visited the site of the old fort over the years. However, it has been eroded by the river. Nothing remains, but in its history of the area, the event is still known as that of the beast. Dune was a stronghold, a crescent fort, overlooking Coon the Heishke, the Bay of the Fish, this fort is located north of Kilahene, facing the sea. It was this fort the sleeping serpent was disturbed and assaulted by the young boy. And Ballybunion takes its name from the Balia, townland, Bunyan, Bunzun, and Bonanog from the Jordan retainers. Balia, or Balia Hania, the townland of the deer, took its name due to the proliferation of deers, and also deer antlers and bone fragments that have been found in the area. And according to other sources, the name was known as Clockstown, which took its name from the Clockons that dotted the landscape and was inhabited by our people. A Clockon was a small house type with stone walls and a stone roof. Sometimes a timber roof or branches were used and sods were employed as roofing materials. Another townland, Barnadaric, the Red Gap, which takes its name from the reddish soil found near the entrance to a fort or stronghold in the area. This fort or stronghold is now gone. Another townland, La Harden, takes its name from the geographical area it is situated in. La, mean in half, and Ardon, a plateau or level place in the land. La Harden or La Hardon can be found by leaving Ahafona in Ballybunnan and then following the winding road from Drummond and Mohan. This road levels off to La Harden with extensive views of the Cashin Estuary and North Kerry. Farron Pierce takes his name from Farron, meaning the land of Pierce, or also an alder tree. This is just a taste of the townlands of the area. I'll go into those townlands in much deeper detail in other podcasts. The arrival of the first people to Kilehenna and Balie, Nakedgrina, the first people, along the shoreline of Kilehenny and Balie, occurred during the late Mesolithic period 7000 to 4000 B.C., these early settlers were a fish, fowl and food gathering culture who roamed the countryside peacefully and seashore in search of their daily food supply, such as shellfish and fish. 
deer of Killehenny was rich in food supplies, with a forest full of red wild deer, wild pig, and berries, along with shellfish found along the shoreline of Killehenny and the wild boar and salmon. Evidence of this to prove provenance to my podcast are axed stone smittle whorls and many more items, including bone comb fragments, which are now housed in the National Museum of Ireland. Along the Kitties River were sighted their primitive dwellings, constructed from the hides of the wild boar and wild deer that roamed the landscape of North Kerry. Over the years, several hot sites have been found in the area, indicating a presence of occupation, with burden stones and fragments of tools used from their ancient fires have been found. These fires and old sites have been levelled over the years in the preparation for both of the golf courses, old and new. Within the dunes they cooked their fires and left their refuse heaps, called kitchen middens. I have covered this in another episode, entitled Primitive Dwellings in the Santals de Ballier, so when you get a chance, check it out, it's a good podcast. During the Neolithic period, the landscape of Kelehenny and Ballier changed with the cultivation of the landscape of the area. The commencement of farming and the clearance of the land, thus the population increased during this period dramatically. Evidence found of this period had been broken saddle grounds found in the area, which were used in the production of flour and other broken tools. During the Iron Age, 1200 BC, an early Christian period, the rise in the population in the area increased with the arrival of the old clan system and their beliefs and the Brehan laws which were enforced in the area. A large population around the area of Kilihina and Bali was there with house types, just as Tlokans, as I've stated before, built only of stones from the seashore. Artifacts found from this period were Iron Age pins found in the Santals during the 1940s, day-dated to the Latin style and are now in the National Museum of Ireland. At the mouth of the Cashin River, south of Kilihini townland, there was a pre-patrician settlement called Inish Labyrinth or Lavra. All that we know of the island, it was named after a king called Fiacra Lavra, who was an ancestor of the race of Kier. It should be noted. Later, around the year of 812, we read in the writings of the wars with the Gael with the Gaul that the holy island at the mouth of Kasan Kiri Lucra of the Cashin was raided by reconnaissance Viking forces who ravaged and plundered the island and put the holy men to the sword, forcing them to flee upriver to another sanctuary, another special place, called Derico or Duramakua, mentioned in the Phaedra of Festologies of Angus the Caldee. I have covered Ratu and Derico, so when you get a chance, have a listen to those podcasts. It will enhance this episode and give you another historical perspective. In local lore, it has been handed down that yet another settlement existed within the dunes in Kilihini, but its mission and leader we don't know of. Was this another satellite settlement connected with Etna or Athena? Was it another Kaldi, lost in time and the moving sands of Kilihini? The sands of time have covered the evidence However, bones and skeletons have been found in the area from time to time, which must be noted from all periods, which indeed complicates its rich history and culture. I hope you've enjoyed this first part in the series of ancient parish Kilihini. I have enjoyed travelling out there to visit the site and along the Cashin River or Kusan Kiri Lucra. In the second part, I will cover the arrival of the Normans, landlords, evictions, the Great Irish Holocaust of 1846 and Black 47, and our people and names who were here in the area before, during and after the Great Irish Famine. Don't forget to click the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel, which will cover the visual aspects of the podcasts during the year. So for now, slán, bye. Before I go, if you would like to support my ongoing research and podcast episodes, why not buy me a coffee? This will be used to update my research and equipment. I will give everyone who contributes a shout-out on my series. 
Just click on the link below to support us in any way, big or small. Thank you. That's buymeacoffee.com forward slash YXQ Danny. Thanks for listening to our show. Through its people, its heritage and its rugged coastline, this is truly Danny Houlihan's Irish experience. Bye for now. Before I go, if you'd like to support my ongoing research and podcast episodes, why not buy me a coffee? This will be used to update my research and equipment. I will give everyone who contributes a shout-out on my series. Just click on the link below to support us in any way, big or small. Thank you. That's buymeacoffee.com forward slash YXQDanny.